Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome once again to Thank Fellow It's Friday. This is actually episode 149 of ICB TV, so we're nearly at our one and a half century mark, and uh, that reflects a number of things that we've done, not my age, but never mind. Um, it's really good to have you with us here, and it's the 2nd of July. We're already into the second half of the year now, so uh, yeah, we be interesting to see how the second half pans out. Uh, following the way that the first half went, but uh, at least to help you through the, the uh, minutiae and even bigger stuff of tax and furloughs and everything else, of course, I'm joined by Jackie. Hi, Jackie. Good afternoon, everyone. Lovely to be with you. A um, few bits to cover today. I shall dive straight in. Um, the only real news on furlough, don't forget, is now that we're into July and who would ever believe we got here this quickly, um, is that from the 1st of July, the CJRS claim drops from 80% to 70%. Now, that's a, that's a big drop. Don't forget the employees, the workers still get 80%. So now, if somebody is on furlough, the employer is having to contribute 10% of that furloughed wages, plus pay the NIC, the employer's NIC, and the employer's pension contributions. Where that, And that's going to become a considerable cost, because obviously next month, for the last two months, that's uh, August and September, it drops to 60%. So there is an increasing cost to the employer here if they are still keeping people on furlough. Now, as we're aware, hopefully everything's going to open up on the 19th of this month. We'll see what happens. But the word was out that we do need to watch out to see what's going to happen to um, a number of uh, businesses who may or may not continue and uh, who may or may not be making redundancies. So it's going to be uh, an interesting couple of months to see what's going to happen. Um, following on from that, Gary probably knows more about this than I do, but I was just reading from the company's house website, the email came out the other day, about the number of incorporations that have happened in the last quarter. This is April to June. And apparently, as of the 30th of June, a few facts and figures for you here, Gary will already have these, 4,513,392 incorporated companies in the UK in total. However, um, I think it's effective. So I think this means active, not dormant. It's just over 4,100,000. So that's the total number of incorporated businesses. And the vast majority of those will be smaller micro businesses. So absolutely in our ICB market. But interestingly enough, in the last uh, three months, so April to June, there were just over 117,000 new incorporations and 14,600 dissolutions. Now, that year on year is the biggest increase for the second quarter of the year than it's been since 2012. And that's what, nine years. So that, that's a big increase. Um, and over that time in the quarter, I think it was something like a 76% increase on that quarter. And for the first time, incorporations in this quarter have exceeded incorporations between January and March. Now, a lot of figures in there, but basically, I think you've got to take that in line with what's happening with the pandemic. The fact that the businesses are increasing might mean that people are being laid off, might mean that people have decided to go self-employed and set up their own limited company or whatever. So, um, you know, that, that I've just found some interesting statistics there that came out uh, this week from Company's House. Yeah, I think they're quite interesting. And uh, a number of people have suggested it might also mean that some people have moved out of the grey economy because they didn't get any sort of subsidy whilst we were in COVID. So, you know, they might suddenly have decided, oh, by the way, did I mention I'm, I'm running a business? But, uh, you know, it's yeah. the number of ways of looking at it. I think the figures on uh, size of business and number of businesses has always been just mind boggling as far as I'm concerned. 8,000 large businesses. 35,000 medium and actually only about 118,000 small. Everything else is a micro. So that's what less than 800 and 650,000. 650,000 turnover. Yeah. yeah. So that's our market. So in other yeah. words, we've got about 4.2 million businesses out there somewhere. Uh, I don't know what you're doing out there, really. I mean, why aren't you out there? What are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> Come on, we, we um, want more than 4 million. But yeah. I, I, uh, yeah. It, 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 I think it, it shows that so many people are actually looking after their own accounts still. Um, and as you know, Jackie, with the new tax agents that work and with the making tax digital, everybody's going to have to move over onto computers and bookkeepers are the right people to help them with that. You know, it's not a, uh, you know, it's, it's not, that's not an accountant's job. That's our job for these micro businesses. So let, let's get out there. And yeah. we, those of you who are students, hurry up. There's plenty of work. We, we need you. 
Ab absolutely. Um, and uh, talking of HMRC and tax agents, as you're aware, we've got a, a, a lot of consultations going up at the moment. We've got two due in on the 13th, one of which um, is down and the other I'm going to be doing next week. Um, and they're all to do with uh, tax agents, payments of tax. And actually the big one that's going in next week is the complete 10 year plan to modernize the whole way the tax administration service goes. Now, I just, in the process of writing an article on these, we have said we'd get out to you all um, what ICB have said on these. And I'm putting an article together for the next newsletter week when that goes out on all the consultations we've taken part in since last year and a summary of what we as ICB have said. So you will be aware of everything that we've been doing. And it's, it's certainly been, been quite a lot on that. Um, yeah, the, the, the tax agent particularly, I mean, I think we're, um, you know, we, we've been discussing this for a long time. And I, our concern, I think, Jackie, is that government is going to dumb down a little bit. I mean, one, one proposal was that anybody could call themselves a tax agent provided they had professional endeavour to insurance. Yeah. And, you know, I, I discussed, I said to Jackie, we need to say something, you know, if, if you said, well, doctors don't need to be qualified, but if they chop off the wrong leg, don't worry, the, the, the professional indemnity insurance will cover you. It's not acceptable. Uh, absolutely. And we've gone back very strongly on that from ICB. Yeah. We've made that point very, very strongly indeed. And I think all the professional bodies think the same thing. And also with MTD, what's coming out with the new MTD for uh, income tax for self-assessment, which comes out in mandated in 23, is that a lot of um, the powers that be that HMRC seem to think this is going to be done by the individual and not by the agents or the bookkeepers. And as we said before on this, this forum, that um, all the professional bodies are saying, well, yes, you might have someone who is savvy and knows how to do this, but the vast majority of people are not going to be able to. So very much watch this space because we think within the next year or 18 months, there's going to be an even bigger market uh, once the sole traders start realising that actually they can't just do the paper bag brigade at the end of the year for their tax. Um, if, there are, if their income is over 10,000 a year, and that includes private individuals who have a flat that's been rented out, we've covered this before, um, mm. then um, yeah, they're gonna be involved in MTD and are probably gonna need some help. So the workshop that I was on yesterday was an interesting one because it was talking about how much can you rely on the guidance that you get from HMRC. Now, I'm not talking about the sort of the search engines that you put in, and if you're lucky, very lucky, you will come up with the, 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 the page you want to find. We, we all know and love HMRC search engine, don't we? Um, but this is to do with the guidance that you're given. And we spent an hour and a half, if not more, discussing the differences between guidance and advice and what HMRC is giving out. Now, when we did the tax agents um, response, there is, an, uh, there is a, a suggested definition as to what splits guidance and advice. And I, I raised this a couple of weeks ago with you. Um, but they're now saying that, uh, is what HMRC give you advice or guidance now? And how much can you rely on it? Now, for example, if you use the employment status tool, so that's the CEST tool, and if you were uh, with us on Tuesday, Ian was talking about that. Um, providing that you put the correct information in, then the result that comes out of that as to whether you should be employed or self-employed or they're really not sure, um, you can rely on that guidance for your employment status. However, it must be remembered that if the rules change or if HMRC changes or legislation changes or their guidance changes, that may be made retrospective. So we're really not sure how you could, how much you can still rely on this. And that's gonna be an interesting one. I'll keep you up to date on that one because I know our members do, do look at that a lot. And I mean, it might be, for example, I know a couple of years ago, the HMRC, um, I'm not sure if it was PAY, well, I think it was NIC tool, was actually coming back with the wrong answers for a couple of weeks until it was pointed out. And of course, people would have been using that to process their payroll. So it's a whole, lot of work going in there on that. Now, um, I just want to pop back to what we did on Technical Tuesday before I get into anything else. Um, my grateful thanks, as I said, to both Ian and Esther for their contribution to Technical Tuesday, which was on the very nitty area of IR35. And we, anyone who's on, um, who uh, was, was on that webinar will know that there was a question raised about um, holidays and uh, holiday money being retained from 
the deemed employee. And we had a brief chat about this after the webinar. And just want to reiterate what both Ian and Esther said is that there should be no deductions under IR35 for anything other than tax and NI. There are no other deductions at all. But, and also the ruling, the ruling is now that the deemed employer cannot deduct the employer's NICs from what they're paying the, the worker. However, what came out from some of the members, and Esther has confirmed that she has seen this, is that once the contract drops within to the realms of IR35, what the clients are doing is they're saying, okay, we used to charge us £3,000. Now that's going to cost us £400 in employers NIC. So for that job, we're only going to pay you £2,600. So they've got around the idea of not deducting employers NICs from the employee because that should always be a business cost by saying, actually, that cost we agree with you. Now we're not going to pay you that much. We're going to pay you this much less. And then they're saving that as well. So this is going to be an interesting one again. So if anybody is in this situation, I would like to uh, you to point this out to us because we're very interested in gathering some information. Now, I am just going to share my screen because I do want to show you um, where those webinars are going to be. Now, what we've done at the moment, the, the IR35 on Tuesday was open to basically all members and payroll agents. So if you want to find that to watch it again, and I know that those of you who even did join us and watch it probably need to watch it again to get the information. If you go into the tax agents page, because this is where we put it at the moment, down here is the IR35 link, which will take you to both the Technical Tuesday program itself, the slides that we put up and the handout that Esther has very uh, carefully put together. However, we've got it up twice because also that was open to payroll agents. So if you now have a look on the payroll agents page where you will see all of the Ian's information here, if you go into payroll webinars, it's there as well, along with all of the other Wages Wednesdays that uh, Ian is doing for us. So there's a, there's a lot there, so find yourself around, but that's how to find it. I know we're trying to sort out how we're gonna put some of these uh, technical Tuesday webinars up, but at the moment, it's there for both payroll agents and tax agents. So now, um, nothing really much else on, um, on COVID or anything else, but there was an interesting email came out this morning on the VAT on customs duties. So I'm actually going to quickly run through this. Now, I'm not going to belabor the point on this one because uh, not all of you deal with import export VAT, but I know some of you do. So um, I'm going to give you literally the thanks to gov.uk because this is a straight copy from their website. So this is not my work. This is gov.uk's work. Just a little update on some of the things that have come out this week. Now, this is all to do with temporary imports. We've covered importing and exporting and what happens to the VAT and VAT in the EU and you know, postpone VAT and that's really, but this is slightly different because this is to do with goods that are moving in and out of the country and not necessarily staying here. So first of all, let's have a look at inwards processing. Now, basically, if you are bringing some goods into the UK, either to repair them or you're manufacturing them and then maybe exporting it, um, it may very well be that you do not need to pay import VAT on the goods you're importing or even put them through the postponed VAT account, but you defer the VAT and you can uh, defer the VAT and everything else until such time as they're exported and then that works out all right. So you can suspend customs duty and import VAT if you're bringing these goods in. So, for example, you've got the, the one that's up there, you've got some camera equipment coming into the UK from France for repairs with the intention of returning them to France or you're buying in fabric. You're going to make the particular garments and you're going to export those. You can actually suspend customs duties and import that. And there is a link there to the gov.uk website, which gives you all of the information and how it works. And the same thing happens with outwards processing. So you can temporarily export goods outside uh, the EU. Now, the moment, as you know, if you export them out, they're going out at zero rate. But when you bring those goods back, you would normally have to pay import VAT on them. 
So if these have gone out already and are coming back in following some sort of processing or repair, it may be that you can either have your customs duty cancelled or you actually pay less than you would normally. So again, that's the opposite. These computers say going out to Germany to be repaired and coming back into the UK. Or you're exporting your fabric to Romania, they are doing the work and then you're importing the goods back in and that sort of thing. And again, there's a link there. So I'm just gonna quickly go through those. If you want to get access to this, go through this again and you'll have the notes available. The slides will be available, I think, for you. And then uh, you, you can click on these links. Quick one on temporary admission. Um, this is where you can uh, temporarily import goods or move goods around uh, for two years before you re-export them. So again, um, you might be bringing in samples, equipment or items for auction, exhibition or set. Now, it may be that you're bringing these in, you're using them for a period of two years and then you're exporting the equipment back. So there would be necessarily, you can uh, bring them in on a temporary import license and not have to pay any import VAT. And again, um, you can do it if you're the person using the goods or you're arranging this. So this is open to intermediaries as well. Um, again, this is returned goods relief. So this is another similar one. You're re-importing items that have uh, previously been exported. You'll need to make sure that they haven't been altered or anything like that. So as I say, um, I'm going to very quickly go through these. Uh, the, example they've got there is office furniture because you are moving back to the UK from an EU country where you were based you previously exported the goods you're bringing them back they haven't been uh, majorly uh, changed and you can bring them back in customs warehousing we have mentioned before now this is where you are bringing goods in to put them into a storehouse or a warehouse before you export them so um Anything that goes into uh, a warehouse, a bonded warehouse, you only pay the tax when you actually bring those goods into free circulation into the UK. So if you are bringing goods into the UK, storing it and then exporting it out. So there they've got children's toys from China, they're stored in a warehouse and then immediately exported to Portugal without you actually bringing them into the UK into free circulation, which means you can sell them in the UK you won't have to pay uh, any uh, tax or duty there. And uh, intermediaries, uh, all of these rules and regulations, if you're using an intermediary to do this, so for uh, dealing with your imports, exports, check with them. Um, there is an online trader tool, which on the gov.uk, which does explain all this and takes you through what uh, options are available for you. Uh, there's a couple of links there. And uh, if you are in this, it's very worthwhile signing up to that government's UK weekly newsletter, because these are the sort of things where I get most of my information from. So let me uh, stop sharing my screen. That's everything from me today. As I say, it's a quick belt through, because I know there's only a few of you are probably even interested in that. So hopefully for the rest of you, it wasn't too bad. And um, yes, have we got any questions? I ask myself. Not yet. I mean, it's, it's interesting you're talking about moving goods around, etc. Uh, oh, excuse me. Bless you. Um, Chris Packham, who I'm not always the biggest fan of, but he um, he was tweeting something today saying he, he was showing a little plastic tub of pears, chunky pears, which people buy for their lunch, grown in Argentina, packed in Thailand, sold in the UK. Now, on my calculation, that's about 18,000 miles. Now, bearing in mind the cost of one of those little tubs of pears, somebody somewhere isn't get very, being paid very much for buying them and selling them in the first place or packing them across in Thailand or something or other. Mm. And yet we grow pears, well, Evesham, Garden of England, Kent, yeah. you know, all the way down there. I mean, it, it just seems odd, doesn't it? But very. the strange thing is that um, what they're talking about with this um, group that I get involved with, the all-party party group, parliamentary group on blockchain is that when blockchain comes in it will be starting to ask questions like that why are you buying from x when actually y which is closer and, and is better for the planet and it's, it's greener environments etc why aren't you using that instead so uh, blockchain has got many uses um I'm, I'm not happy with all of them but uh, there seems to be some things in there that are possible and in fact we've got one of our members 
a very large organization with 70 or 80 bookkeepers or something rather, and they work with a particular sector and they compare business to business. And by joining into their group, you can actually get a comparison so that when you're running your business, you can be told, oh, most people don't pay that for their power or most people don't pay that for their well, I know, stationery, whatever it might be. Other people are paying less. Now, that sounds good because you can look at savings where it becomes a problem and not with this particular company because they're very ethical and above board is it can then become manipulative because you get somebody who comes in and says, right, I can supply all these people for you and I'll give you 10 percent commission or something. Rather. So, you know, it, it, everything has a positive and a negative, doesn't it? You know, no, and, and, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Anyway. Um, now, a couple of uh, notes I'd like to make from this week. We've we've had a, a member again um, who shall not remain who shall remain um, secret. Not I won't mention the name. Uh, feels that she had wrongly advised her client um, to uh, take a grant, and the client therefore got a penalty, and she's offered to pay the penalty. Now, the client, being a decent client, has said, no, 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 you shouldn't do that. He said, um, you know, we take your advice. And you, so um, if you're faced with something like this, you shouldn't make that payment. You've all got professional indemnity insurance. You should tell your insurer first. The insurer will then decide what to do. That's what your insurance is for. Um, it may be that it isn't actually your fault. I don't know. That doesn't even come into it. But if you're going to give that man, I mean, Jackie can uh, tell me if this is correct but if you're going to give him i don't know three thousand pound or whatever it is that's an income isn't it you can't just pay somebody jet to hmrc off without it going through the book somewhere no i think it's got to be and uh and also um it was interesting because when i was in practice on the odd occasions that i forgot to and i'll have my hands up to this i'm sure most of you have done this if not all of you um miss the say for example the cis deadline return on the 19th of march and you get an immediate 100 pound fine now 100 pounds is is not the end of the world and this was pre-days you know we had professional damage insurance but certainly the rules and regulations weren't anywhere near as tight as they are now and i i, I would willingly pay the 100 pounds because that was my fault but this is this is something you know much bigger and quite different and of course the rules have changed now so yes it is something that uh, and of course it will be income because um depending on what that uh what that income would have been it would have been income to the client anyway so yeah it should be even if it comes in as income and is then perhaps offset no i actually finds i don't think you're offset for tax purposes anyway so difficult one that one yeah uh, it, it is a difficult one but i and i don't think yeah i mean i take your point about 100 pound it's neither here nor there hopefully you didn't do it too often but um, obviously, where do you draw the line? Well, 150, well, that's a bit much, or 3,000, or is it 3,500, or is it more than four, or or what, really? Um, I mean, you do have professional damage insurance. That's what it is there for. Um, they're there, you know, it's there to fight your corner and to protect you, and, you know, it will pay up for things like that. Um, and, you know, it's to cover error. It won't cover anything that you do which is illegal. It will cover an error. So bear that in mind. Um, I don't know about you, Jackie, but I remember the old days when they had something called chauffeur plan, which was if you lost your license, they would pay for you to have a chauffeur. So everybody <laughs> could get their license so they could have a chauffeur. Yeah. And so I did no hold on. If you get done for drunk uh, drink driving or something like that, it doesn't click in. It's it's for some other reason. So I think I think that com particular company disappeared very quickly. There's um, a very interesting uh, comment from Sarah. Hi, Sarah. Hopefully this is your block chain. Uh, hopefully they will be asking why we buy beef from Australia miles away. It will be great if blockchain does ask these questions. Well, that that's going to open up a whole can of worms, isn't it? The Australian but, deal. But where do the worms come from? I mean, which country where they can? <laughs> anyway, um, Maggie says, have received a couple of invoices from the USA company and Irish company now showing a GB VAT number, IT yeah. licenses, and charging UK VAT. Okay to reclaim? Yes, it will be, because if you think about it, we were talking about exporting to the EU and any other country and having the, the, the client is going to have to pay import VAT uh, or whatever, unless they do postpone VAT accounting. So what you've got now is your USA and Irish companies, if they're selling into this country, have to register with UK VAT. So they're charging you VAT, which you pay them, which is their uh, output VAT because it's on sales, but it is your import VAT 
you have a properly constituted UK VAT. So yeah, I think you, you can claim the VAT back. I think there's going to be a lot of buttoning down over the next 12 months on foreign companies and foreign owned companies. Uh, I think the G8 or the G12 or whatever it was got together and decided they were going to work together to avoid companies um, not paying tax anywhere. And I think, wasn't it, um, was it Microsoft or something rather in, in Ireland and 300, made 300 million pounds worth of profit and didn't pay, didn't pay a penny of tax because they were registered in the Bahamas or something rather. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah I, yeah, I mean, yeah, it's a lot of money. And uh, Sarah's, yeah, Sarah's come back uh, following on about the insurance. The problem is that professional insurance, it the professional insurance in their questions suggest they will put their prices up if you claim off them. The insurance companies do not encourage claims and they don't appear to be fighting in your corner. Well, unfortunately, that's the problem I, I found with all insurance. The minute you make a claim, your premiums go up to pay for it. So, um but that doesn't. It, you still, you still need to uh, to notify them. So, but yeah, I'm there with you, Sarah. Yeah, I'm afraid it's a bit like Bupa. As you get older and you start needing Bupa, it comes too expensive for you to afford it. But anyway, <laughs> um, Donna has a question: If a company imports from China and does duty paid, which the seller sorted out, should the UK client receive a C seventy nine duty? I don't think can be reclaimed. I'm not sure. I'd need someone with a bit more knowledge on duty. That I know the VAT can. Customs, customs duty, I don't think can be reclaimed. The C79 is still a weird one because I was under the impression that the C79s would cease in January, but I think for a number of reasons. I know there are members whose clients are still getting C79s. So um I think it depends what you're actually paying and what's on the invoice, Donna. I can't, I think that's my answer to that one. Um, we're still all hoping that the, what is it, third week of July will be the end of lockdown. Um, as we're hopefully coming out of it, I was speaking to our office in Melbourne, um, Matthew in Melbourne um, earlier, and they're back in lockdown there now. They've gone back from partial lockdown, uh, followed by um being released from lockdown to complete lockdown again you know it just keeps bouncing back uh, i didn't ask how far they're up with their with their program of uh, in, in, injections but uh, uh, i am still fed up with every single time i watch it on television you see at least six people getting jabbed and they don't look very happy about it um we, we know what a jab is there's no need to keep showing <laughs> thank you very yeah. much i agree uh, anyway, so she's like uh, um, but yeah, so it, wherever we are in the world is a problem. And uh, talking to Takashwa, our CEO in India, and his wife Priya, um, you know, they've, they've got a lot of problems in India again. And it's, it's well, um, here's me thinking I'm invincible because I've had two jabs, but I don't know. I'm still a bit worried about taking the old mask off. I mean, that's supposed to happen in a couple of weeks' time. And, you know, I said the other day, I'm still a bit concerned when people nudge up to me in in. Uh, waitrose or something or other so yeah mm. it, I don't know it'll take a while to get used to it I think yeah and Sarah's come back thank you Sarah confirm what I thought customs duty is your cost and you cannot reclaim duty I thought so because the C79 uh, I think covers import that if you get the C79 um so yeah thanks for that Sarah but that just confirms what I what I thought I'd got right um okay everyone's being very quiet this afternoon looks like it's going to be a short session Gary today yeah, um, well, half past. No, I don't actually. Um, I was thinking that uh, I needed to come up with a television program, but I'm sure everybody's going to be glued to the television to watch either tennis or uh, the <laughs> football. Um, and um, it's a shame about Wales. I was cheering on for Wales and, and that didn't work. And obviously before that, I was um, hoping that Scotland would go through. It would have been lovely to see the three of us in, in the final four. I, I don't know how it would have fought it out, but you know, that would have been really great to see all the home nations in, but unfortunately it didn't happen. Um, and we now have made so much of, of beating Germany uh, in the last round. Um, I'm hoping they've got a bit of life left to try and do even better and get to get to the final here. But we'll, wonder, we'll wonder how many of wonder how many of our members actually watched the 66 final, Gary. Um I don't know. It'd be I was just those who were old enough to watch it. Yeah, actually, I, I was thinking before, 20, just just 
slightly under now, 25 years ago, uh, when we formed the Institute. Um, I just wondered if people might like to tell us at some stage what they were doing 25 years ago on the 1st of November, 19, um, <coughs> oh, sorry, 1996, when the Institute was formed. Uh, I know a lot of you are going to say, well, I wasn't born, and some more of you are going to say I was at school, so at the risk of making me feel very old, um, it'd be interesting to know what you were up to 25 years ago. What was your life like? Where were you living? What were you doing? And, and um, we're, we're looking at all sorts of things. And um, yeah, <clears throat> it's quite interesting. I've got some, um, Peter's come back and said, yes, he, he watched it. He remembers it well. I have quite an amusing story, if I can tell you about the, the 1966 World Cup final. I am not a football fan. My grandsons think I am the world's worst person, grandmother, because um, I don't like football particularly like football but I watched the 66 final because the young man that I was currently going out with at the time said you will sit and watch this match because this is the only time in your life that you will find you will see England beat Germany in a World Cup final in England and he was absolutely right so far <laughs> so right. um oh Paul the slides for EP 148 link isn't working okay thanks Paul we'll get that checked and changed thank you Paul that was the one from Tuesday. Yeah, Alex is listening in, so uh, we'll get that checked. Yeah, I was, um, I was quite interested talking about the football, that um, they were talking about this new GB News programme that's out, and it, it, it had a fairly large audience to begin with, but it dropped off. BBC News, that we think everybody listens to and watches, um, about 80,000 people. That's it, out of the entire country, which I know what all the fuss is about the news there for. But... The football was apparently watched by 20 million. So that shows you where everybody's heart really is. Uh, uh, Helen, Helen, November 1996, just got married and returning from honeymoon in Guatemala. Very nice too, Helen. Oh, nice one. Yeah, very nice. Uh, hang on, quick technical one before we get any more 96 stories coming in. Um, okay, exporting goods. Has to be exported within three months to be okay for zero rated. Practically, can they be zero rated up front and amended only if the paperwork doesn't come through? Uh, technical Helpline said it was advisable to take a deposit of the VAT money that could be refunded on receipt of export paperwork. Now, I think this is probably dependent on who's doing the exporting. Um, yes, that will certainly work, but I know if you don't charge the VAT and it's later to be found not to have been exported within the time you are responsible for the VAT. So what I think then happens is if you can't then invoice them and get the VAT back, uh, you have to take what was your zero rated and that then becomes your gross sale, which includes 20% uh, VAT. And I know that that happens there. So um, yeah, good, good thing if you're not sure. I think it depends on how quickly you're exporting. And of course, what used to happen I remember when we were selling artworks from the art gallery I worked for and these people were saying that they were exporting it and we had a, an export form that they could complete and sign and then we could charge them zero rate VAT. Um, but I think that has been clamped down on now. I think if you are selling to an individual who is then going to export, if it's being delivered to a person in this country, you have to charge them VAT and they then have to claim it back at the port of exit. So uh, that's that one. Got an interesting one there from uh, Renata Stamoulis. Hello, Renata. Uh, could you please explain if we as bookkeepers have to be registered with the Information Commissioner's Office for data protection? Yes. Uh, it's quite simple. Um, depending on how you read the rules, you, you can persuade yourself that you don't need to, but ICB says that you should be registered because you're holding data and it's the safest way. And it's, I don't know what the latest price is, but it used to be about 70 pound a year or something or other. So yeah, keep it up to date. Uh, be careful with your data. We are gonna be doing something soon on the Data Protection Act and GDPR because um, people have always been overly concerned um, or completely blase about GDPR. And, and we need to sort of find the common ground in the middle. Um, you have to be careful when you're dealing with people's data and, and the, the rule is treat it as if it were your data and somebody else had got it. So, you know, what you don't want them to know, they don't want you to know either. But um, I think I mentioned last week that one of our members uh, had been told on a forum to destroy old data from a client that had just disappeared. And the answer is no, you can't. You have to keep it for five years for the tax ban. You have to keep it for six years for money laundering purposes. Um, but also, I think we get a lot of questions about 
um, you know, I'm looking for new business. Can I email clients, uh, potential clients, etc.? And all all that sort of thing. I think when GDPR first came in, there were a lot of people making money from going around and frightening frightening the death out of people about what they could and couldn't do. Um, as long as you're careful, a GDPR is there to assist um, you. But if you're communicating with business to business, then that's not covered. It's the individual that is or it, that GDPR is really all about. Now, that's an oversimplification. We're trying to get a GDPR expert to come in. Uh, most of those tend to work for the Information Commissioner's Office, and then they're not the most uh, cheerful people to listen to. So we are trying to find somebody who actually knows what they're talking about and can talk to us about that. So as soon as we've got somebody, we will let you know and, and you will be told. Oh, Judith was making cream cakes in Sainsbury's 25 years ago. Nice one, Judith. Oh, right. OK, well, it shows you the different backgrounds we've got for our people. Uh, hang on, I think Sarah's come back again. Um, Sarah, I think this is yours, Sarah. Please get jabbed. My son has COVID this week and we are isolating. However, I have had my single jab and my husband and niece in our bubble and the three of us have stayed negative, so it does clearly work. I think that's single jab. Um, so it clearly works because they've stayed negative. Nicola Payne has come back and said, November 96, I was pregnant with my daughter. She was born January 97. Thank you, Nicola. Um, that, that's good to know. The excitement didn't get too much for you, at least. Um, so that, <laughs> that, 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 that is brilliant. Um, is that the daughter that does the videoing who we've all met? I presume it is. Oh, I'm off to have my second jab in an hour, says Susanna Whelan. Good, um, but please don't send any picture that I have to look at. You know, it's good. I don't <laughs> mind, but I, I don't look at mine, so I don't expect to look at somebody else's. So anyway, um, right. I think, Jackie, that's probably about it. We're, we've yep. done all the technical stuff. As I say, I'm not going to give you any, any suggestions on television or anything else this weekend, because I'm sure you're all going to be supporting the UK, which, uh, England, whichever part of the UK you come from. Jackie, thank you very much, as always. Um, you've had a busy couple of weeks. Um, you've got an yeah. even busier coming couple of weeks. Yes, the next uh, 10 days yeah. is going to be really busy, yeah. Yeah, I'm afraid it's the only way we're going to get our name out there. Oh, and um, by the way, those of you who read the Daily Express, um, ICB's Amy Copeland was, uh, she was asked to comment about the new, um, it's actually the new furloughing, and she made a comment, and so ICB gets got a bit of coverage there, so that's in the Daily Express, so anybody please have a look for that. And very quickly, just before we go, what oh, was Nicola, the 25, uh, yeah. Nicola, we're not going to say how old you are, Nicola, um, has celebrated your second wedding anniversary working for ACCA practice as a junior accounts assistant. Wow. Okay. So you've really come on in the world. You're now an ICB bookkeeper. Great. Thank you, Nicola. <laughs> I was right. going to say, good so, place to start, though, but you've done well since then. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Oh, and so, Carol said she's received her T-shirt for winning the Inspire Talk quiz. Oh, good. Brilliant. Well, you need to send us a picture at some stage. You can't do it now, but please send us a picture of you wearing it. And uh, have a lovely weekend, everybody. Yeah. Um, the weather, I'm not sure what it's doing. It's, it's really nice down here, but I think rain is promised. Um, but it won't matter because you'll be inside watching the footage. So <laughs> bye, everybody. Have a, have a lovely weekend. See you soon. Bye. bye. Take care.